Hello, and welcome to the Federal Society's webinar call. Today, March 29th, 2023, we host a combination post-oral argument courthouse steps on Smith versus United States, which was argued yesterday before the court, and Samia versus United States, which had an oral, oral argument earlier today, uh, two cases related to criminal law and procedure. My name is Kayla Kleiss, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups here at the Federal Society. As always, please note that the expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call, as the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. Now, in the interest of time, we'll keep my introduction of our speaker brief, but if you'd like to know more about him, you're welcome to access his impressive full bio at fedsoc.org. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Robert McBride, who's a partner in charge of the Kentucky Office of Tass, Tenius, and Hollister. Prior to his time there, Mr. McBride was an assistant United States attorney in the Eastern District of Kentucky for over 15 years. As an AUSA, Mr. McBride first chaired criminal jury trials in the U.S. District Court and held appeals before the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Additionally, he was the district's national security prosecutor and the anti-terrorism advisory council coordinator. During his tenure as an AUSA, Mr. McBride also held several leadership positions. In 2006, he was assigned as the manager of the London branch office. Shortly thereafter, he was promoted to criminal chief and served in that position until January 2010. And more recently, he was the supervisor on the Fort Mitchell branch office, where he handled a number of high-profile investigations and prosecutions. Mr. McBride also served the United States Navy Judges Advocate General Corps for over 10 years. His major assignments included senior prosecutor in the island of Guam, officer in charge of a detachment in New Orleans focusing on criminal defense, and the staff judge advocate recruit training command. I'll leave it there. A couple logistical notes uh, before we get started. If you've attended one of our courthouse what steps webinars before, you know we have a general format of an opening statement by our speaker followed by Q&A. In this instance, as we're covering two cases with two separate issues in one program, we'll do two mini courthouse steps uh, covering each case in turn, starting with Smith and moving to Samia. We will then turn to audience Q&A at the end and welcome questions on both cases. To that end, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them by the question and answer feature, and if possible, indicate which case they relate to so that we'll have access to them when we get to that portion of today's webinar. With that, I'll be quiet so we can get to the substance of today's program. Thank you all for being with us today. Mr. McBride, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kayla. I appreciate the kind introduction. So what we're going to talk about first, uh, Timothy Smith versus the United States, and then Adam Samia versus uh, the United States. Both are criminal cases. One deals with venue and one deals with burden issue. Uh, let me start with a question presented in Smith, and then I'll talk a little bit about the facts and the procedural history and then what happened before the court the other day. So before the court was the issue of what was the proper remedy for the government's failure to prove venue uh, in an acquittal, barring re-prosecution, or whether the government may retry the same offense in a different or a more proper venue. So the facts here are fairly straightforward. Timothy Smith was a software engineer and an avid fisherman who lived in Mobile, Alabama. Mobile happens to be in the Southern District of Alabama. Mr. Smith was buying uh, data from a company called Strike Lines, which sold uh, information over the internet uh, for locations of hot fishing spots um, that they had identified and um, were used and bought by fishermen all over the world. Strike Line's headquarters is in Pensacola, and Pensacola is in the Northern District of Florida. However, its computers were in Orlando, which happens to be in the Middle District of Florida. What Smith did was he hacked into Strike Line's computers and stole their proprietary phishing data um, and then posted it on the internet that he had um, the data and asked people to message him if they wanted access to it. He then turned around and tried to extort Strike Lines for um, other types of data uh, similar to that, which were for hotspots for diving that Strike Lines Hell, in exchange for that, Mr. Smith promised that he would uh, not invade their computers, uh, not sell their information uh, over the internet, and um, show them how to patch up their system so they won't have these intrusions again. Eventually, Strike Line called the police, and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith was uh, indicted. He was indicted in the Northern District of Florida and he was charged with three counts, 
One was a violation of 18 U.S.C. 1030, which is an uh, intrusion into a computer. 18 832, which is theft of trade secrets. And 18 875D, which is making threats over interstate commerce. Um, at trial, uh, the uh, defendant challenged venue uh, for uh, the threats and stealing trade secrets. Uh, he argued that proper that venue was not proper because he was either operating from the Middle District of Florida or Orlando, both not the districts in which the uh, counts the case was being tried. The jury instructions, interestingly, required the jury to find that the government had established proper venue. Otherwise, they had to find the defendant not guilty. He was found not guilty on the computer intrusion fraud under 1030 and guilty on the trade secrets and the threats in interstate commerce. He took it up to the 11th Circuit and the 11th Circuit overturned uh, on the theft uh, for improper venue and sent it back for retrial. And issue was essentially what is the proper remedy in this circumstance when the case uh, goes back uh, by the appellate courts for retrial. According to Mr. Smith, the proper, the proper um, result should in fact be a acquittal or a determination that he cannot be retried uh, based on the government's failure to uh, prove the element of venue. The government, of course, responds that retrial is the proper remedy, it's the historic remedy, uh, and that because the case is coming up through the appellate court, double jeopardy is not implicated as it is still the same case. So uh, there was an interesting argument before the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, in my assessment, I think the court was a little hotter with the petitioner than they were with the government. Um, Justice Thomas started out with kind of a typical straightforward question, which was, except for a speedy trial and insufficiency of the evidence, what other constitutional errors require uh, anything but sending the case back for retrial? And there really weren't any answers for that. But what I find is quite interesting is um, uh, Justice Jackson um, was quite uh, forceful in her inquiry into why um, venue is such a violation that uh, barring, barring trial or retrial was appropriate. Um, she really uh, pushed down to the point of, okay, aren't you really saying that we have to elevate uh, venue to have the same level of importance as an element of the offense? Of course, an element of any offense has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The petitioner attempted to equate uh, venue to the elements of the offense, but had to concede that while an element of the offense has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, venue does not. Uh, and both the court and the petitioner seem to be somewhat unclear about what level of proof venue um, required. And in fact, um, the petitioner had to concede that it isn't always an issue in trials, uh, which, which is true. Um, that it, so the petitioner tried to uh, weave between a double jeopardy argument and a historical venue argument that venue was in fact a jurisdictional pardon me, a jurisdictional issue historically in our jurisprudence, but also there are components of double jeopardy. And I don't think the court was really buying that. With regard to the uh, government, I think they had a much easier time here because uh, this is a traditional remedy. Double jeopardy was not seemingly impl implicated by the questions that the judges had, the justices had for the government. Um, and then I think overall, um, it's going to be difficult for the petitioner to prevail. Even some of the government's uh, historical information was um, in their favor. For instance, they cited a case, uh, uh, Rex versus Welsh, a British case in which 
a man uh, committed a, offenses in London, but was tried in Southwick. He was a, he was on appeal, uh, overturned the conviction. He was taken back to London, retried in London, and convicted. Uh, in the appropriate venue. So as a historical precedent, I think the government probably had the strongest argument there. If I had to guess, I would think that uh, the government is going to prevail here. Let me move on to uh, Samia. Here the issue is, in what context should a non-testifying co-conspirator statement be brutalized? Should the test be within the context of the evidence of the trial and other obvious factors like the number of the defendants, or should we use the four corners test uh, that is currently in use in many districts, which essentially means you look at the document for its in and of itself, much like you might an affidavit in a search warrant, and determine whether or not the document immediately implicates the co-conspirator, uh, the non-co-conspirator, whose statement is not being in, admitted into the trial. So this case is kind of interesting on a factual basis. Um, Samia worked for a man named Paul LaRue. Uh, LaRue was the head of a transnational uh, uh, criminal organization. They uh, conducted drug trafficking and violent acts, money laundering. And um, in order to support this organization, Mr. LaRue had what he called teams of mercenaries. Samia got uh, involved in this organization uh, in 2008 as a mercenary, and at one point expressed, expressed an interest in acting as an assassin. LaRue directed a man named Joseph Hunter to assemble a, a kill team to assassinate a woman named Lee, uh, Lee was a real estate broker in the Philippines, and LaRue felt she had cheated him out of quite a bit of money. So um, Samia um, and others uh, assassinated Lee um, with a man named Hunter. Hunter later told other members of the organization about the murder and um, ended up doing so in a secret meeting in Thailand where he was being recorded by American law enforcement. Uh, he was then arrested in 2021 and became a confidential witness for the DEA uh, and was then arrested in 2013. Petitioner Stillwell were arrested in 2015. Stillwell waived his rights and made a confessional statement. In 2017, the indictment was handed down and the petitioner still were were charged with murder for hire under 19, uh, 1589, um, conspiracy to commit murder for hire, conspiracy to commit murder and kidnap in another country, carrying user firearm or relationship to a murder, uh, conspiracy to launder and conspiracy to launder money, although still wasn't charged with this last count. LaRue pleaded guilty uh, and petitioner still well and Hunter all went to trial. So the issue was whether the uh, routinized statement was sufficient. As a, as a basic um, kind of pretext of the law here, Burton says that a confessional statement of one co-defendant that implicates a non-testifying co-defendant violates the confrontation clause, even with the jury instruction. There have been cases since then that essentially say a properly redacted uh, confessional statement that does on, not on itself or immediately identify the co-defendant uh, is not a violation of the confrontation clause and may be admitted. So when we get to the Supreme Court arguments, the uh, petitioner is arguing in essence that um, the brutalized statement must be evaluated by the court within the context of the evidence available to the government and other circumstances. In particular, what was important to the court was the example where there were simply two defendants on, on the case. And they went through a number of uh, iterations of a hypo hypothetical where uh, a statement was made and entered by the government 
in a not by a non testifying co defendants, where uh, it was quite obvious, despite the fact that the redacted statement uh, did not directly identify the co defendant, where you've only got one other defendant. It seems pretty obvious on its face from the hypotheticals that the um, co defendant was being implicated. Well, let me talk a little bit about some of the questions from the court. So uh, what I thought was quite interesting was um, the proposed rule that uh, seemed to be coming out from, that courts seemed to be um, refining. Um, and that uh, Justice Comey Barrett essentially asked that isn't the proposed rule to apply only where there are two defendants with non-testifying um, co-defendants. In other words, are they asking for an absolute ban on that? Because that does seem to be the most relevant circumstance in which the, uh, the in implication that the statement uh, incriminates the other co-defendant would take place. You know, whether it was, uh, I committed the crime with her, or I committed a crime with one other person, or I committed the crime um, with uh, even by myself, may implicate the other simple singular co-defendant that is sitting there. So the line of questioning essentially started to get down to is, well, is it ever possible to have a Burtonized statement appropriately? The petitioner's position was that yes, interestingly, yes, they're not asking for burden to be overturned, but rather that this uh, means of doing it within the context of the evidence and the circumstances surrounding the indictment, that kind of burdenized statement is more, um, uh, is much less likely to implicate the confrontation clause than simply looking at the four corners of the document. And of course, there are other remedies the government would use, if, which is not use the statement at all, uh, further delineation of the uh, brutalized statement, sanitize it even more, um, uh, sever the trial so you have two defendants uh, and um, even sometimes can have two simultaneous juries that hear the different evidence, which actually I've seen used in these kinds of circumstances occasionally. The government's position was, well, uh, I think somewhat weaker. So the government essentially said, you know, we look at the four corners, judge. It's, you know, if it's properly done, it isn't going to implicate the confrontation clause. It isn't going to, on its face, be immediately incriminating to the defendant. But I think here the government got more pushback uh, because uh, even during the argument, the government lawyer had to concede, yes, you know, you you while we look at the document, the, the four corners of the statement itself, there are going to be other circumstances that the government may emphasize the judge should take in, into consideration when brutalizing the, um, the statement. So if I had to make a call on this, I think that uh, the petitioner may prevail here. In my own experience, you know, working with judges, they will sort of um, uh, think about the case in general. In fact, they almost have to when they're brutalizing a statement or accepting a brutalized statement by the government. And I think that's particularly true when you only have two co-defendants sitting at the table. The jury's naturally going to think, well, this person has to be here for something. And where you have such a, an immediate impression of guilt of the other co-defendant, the court generally feels that a jury instruction isn't going to cure that issue. Um, I'd be surprised if there's a special rule for two defendant jurors, but I think there may be a, a little more carving out of um, a little expansion of what's required when properly brutalizing a co-defendant statement. So that's my summary for now. Kayla, do we have any questions?
Well, yes, we are ready for audience Q&A. As those start coming in, and as a reminder to our audience, you can do that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I have a couple that I'd love to pose, starting with Sam, yeah, since we're already on that topic, then we can go backwards in time to Smith. Um, you mentioned that the nature of this being a joint trial came up in the questioning um, by Justice Barrett. On that front, how are the legal questions at play affected by the fact that this is a joint trial? Um, or put a different way, if Sammy and Stillwell uh, had been tried separately, would we still be having this conversation? No, we would not. Um, the uh, statements of the co-conspirator um, would not be coming in. Also, the uh, they could actually put the co-conspirator on the stand, and then we wouldn't be having this issue. This could this case could be tried in front of the bench, and then they wouldn't have this issue at all either. One of the concerns with the confrontation clause is that when you have this uh, statement by a non-testifying defendant, there's some concern of Burton about whether or not a jury instruction, well, the concern is a jury instruction is not enough to protect the uh, confrontation clause rights of the other defendant. Even though the jury instruction says, look, you only consider this statement for defendant B, not defendant A. Uh, continuing on the line of questions posed by the court, uh, what questions or lines of questioning were you most interested to see come up in the court? And uh, the counter to that, what were you interested to see not be raised during oral argument? Well, I think in Sania, what I thought was um, most interesting is uh, the government, while they did a great job at their arguments, I think they had to give some ground uh, under the um, practical role, what, what the approach the court sort of boiled down to was, okay, this is sort of a functional problem. How do we make uh, a Burtonized statement appropriate where there are co-defendants and one statement is coming in? And so the jury understands that one statement is only to be considered against the defendant that gave it. So, I think that because it's a functional line of questioning, it's uh, it's really going to become, I think, there'll be some expansion of what a court has to consider when it's evaluating a brutalized statement. I also think that that it will make it a little harder for the government to uh, brutalize uh, certain types of statements, particularly of a sprawl, a, a, uh, a conspiracy that is not sprawling, where it's really just two people involved in in the, the um, conspiracy. What I thought the court, they did focus on it somewhat. I thought they may focus on a little bit more is uh, jury instructions. You know, it's, it's a, a very um, basic part of trying cases in criminal court where jury instructions, both during evidence, uh, admissions during admonitions during evidence and jury instructions um, and admonitions in jury instructions are deemed as the proper remedy for any of these kinds of constitutional violations. So there was less discussion of the jury instructions that, than I expected as, as a prophylactic for this problem. Got it. Uh, following on on that line of thought, it, was it clear um, if uh, the court ruled in favor of Samia what the test for redacted enough would be? I think the test would be, so if you look at, at this series of cases, it goes from uh, a co-conspirator statement um, is that identifies the other defendant is too much. It violates the confrontation clause to a redacted statement is appropriate to a redacted statement can't obviously be redacted to a statement can be modified so that it's basically true, but um, doesn't uh, implicate the co-defendant. So if you say, I and the defendant and a couple of other guys, uh, as the Burton I statement, it could be I and a couple of other guys committed the crime or a couple of other people. So that while it's factually accurate, it isn't directly implicating the defendant. So I think it may be one more step. Now you have to look at the context in which they'll, the evidence will be presented before a judge will approve a brutalized statement. 
and I think that it will be most germane where there are only two defendants at the table. Um, or whether, let me put it this way, where there are only two defendants involved in the conspiracy. You got, you know, five defendants and two of them have already um, pled guilty or, or what have you. It may not be as big a problem. So I think it'll be another edging out of what's appropriate uh, uh, brutalizing of a co-defendant statement. Got it. Um, this may not be relevant, uh, since, as you noted, this is particular to the fact that this is a joint trial. Uh, but assuming the court uh, rules in favor of Samia, what, if any, other kinds of out-of-court statements could be impacted by this ruling? I don't know that any other out-of-court statements would be um, impacted. Um, I mean, most of them are going to be hearsay. I, I don't know what the full record was. Um, there, are, there are exceptions and exemptions to the hearsay rule. I don't know that this will have any impact. Um, this is a pretty discreet issue, these brutalized statements uh, in co-defendants. It may be, it may lead to more separate trials, but um, not many of the judges I've practiced in front of really want to um, waste the time, if it will, the, the judicial time, the witness's time, the defendant's time, and all that goes into a trial to, to have a lot of separate trials. Fair enough. Uh, I'll pose the alternate hypothetical uh, then, and then I'll, we'll wrap out Samia and move to Smith, barring any audience questions. Uh, what are the implications of this case if the court upholds the lower court's ruling? Um, I, I think it'll be business as usual. Fair enough. Um, well, let's switch over to Smith. Uh, to begin, you mentioned one question before the court is the proper remedy for trial in improper venue. I believe this 11th Circuit in this decision also addressed the question of whether a criminal trial's uh, improper venue as to one count requires vacature of the convictions on other counts. Uh, was that question addressed in oral argument or is the focus uh, I solely on appropriate remedy? Uh, it focused solely on the appropriate remedy. Um, the I don't see that as anything the court would be considered, would frankly consider. Um, you know, if you have an acquittal, that's final. Um, if you have a conviction and there's the wrong venue, then that's the issue before the court. Got it. Uh, well, then turning to the ramifications of possible decisions, uh, what are the ramifications of a ruling that makes it impossible to retry someone once improper venue has been proved? I'm sorry, say that again, Kayla. I'm not sure. Uh, of course. Um, what are the ramifications of a ruling uh, in favor of Smith, uh, where you cannot be retried once uh, you've been tried in improper venue and that's it's been decided that you were tried in the wrong place? Well, I think one of the practical implications is um, you will see a lot of more motions to dismiss based on venue. You know, a lot of the current cases involve um, many districts. You've got drug trafficking cases. You've got, you know, theft by electronic means cases. You know, there are a lot of locations that the government can bring a count here. In this case, you actually had three different counts that appear to have um, happened in three different districts. So government may be more careful to identify the count and then try them where they belong. Uh, or they may forego some of uh, this kind of count and rely more on conspiracy because conspiracy, the jurisdiction can lay wherever there is a um, uh, act of a conspirator. Uh, the act of a conspirator in a jurisdiction that advances the, the uh, conspiracy. Got it. Uh, because there were three separate venues in question, how does Smith contend he, sh where does Smith contend he should have been tried? If it wasn't the Northern District of Florida, what does he think this count should have applied? So he thinks that um, the two counts uh, and which were overturned should have been tried in two different places. He thought the theft, or pardon me, the threat should have been tried in Mobile, Alabama, where he was sitting. And then he thought the uh, computer intrusion, no, I'm sorry, the theft of trade secrets should have been tried in Northern District of Florida because that's where their, that's where Sprite Line's computer sat. Got it, okay. Um, 
what, uh, so I'll ask uh, the opposite question uh, once again, are there implications slash what are the implications of this case of allowing the government simply to try again in a new venue uh, when improper venue is proved? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of um, practical difficulties with that for the litigants, the defendants who have to go through the process again. But, you know, that's really true for almost any case where there's a retrial for any reason. Um, the government also, although I would hate to see this kind of thing happen, if, if they separate out different kinds of counts. So if they went after this man in the venues that they could have gone after, he could have had three separate trials in three different places. Now, that's not a good use of, a pro of the government's resources to do that. So they may have selected a particular case. I think what it does is it does two things. It makes the government think more carefully about where they're going to bring a case. Right? And it may give the defendant some certainty as to uh, once there's an indictment, where they're going to be. But I don't think, despite all that, that the judge, that the court is going to rule in the petitioner's favor. Okay. Uh, continuing on in this hypothetical, you mentioned that double jeopardy came up in oral argument. Uh, how, and that it may not be even an issue in this case, how is it not at issue when you can't be tried for something and then you can be tried again for the same charge? Well, traditionally, when you have a case overturned, um, the case and set back down for retrial, it's the same case, right? The, the conviction is vacated and it goes down for the same case. The purpose of double jeopardy is to stop the government from um, trying somebody who's acquitted of the charge again. So since the the judgment is vacated, right? It's sent back down for trial. There's nothing final. In other words, it has not been a finalized, this is a very practical way to look at it. It's not a finalized decision on those counts. So it's sent back to the, to the court to be tried to see if they can get a finalized decision. Because here the court said, no, they didn't prove venue, it's gotta go back down. It doesn't mean that the individual was not guilty. So it's different than being overturned for insufficiency of the evidence, which, as I mentioned earlier, is one of those times it's not sent back down for retrial. As and Justice Thomas hit that right away. What the defense, the pro, pardon me, the defense, the petitioner was trying to do was elevate this issue of venue, which they conceded didn't have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and conceded it isn't really an element of the offense. It's important historically in, a, in a, a way to ensure the community where the case, where, where the acts happened had a say in the resolution of the case. It's not the same thing as a judgment um, on the facts. And, and the petitioner was very kind of cagey about that. They said, well, you know, Justices, this is an important protection of the constitution and it's kind of like an affirmative defense in that it doesn't have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, but because it's so important that, you know, the court shouldn't allow the government to take a second bite at the apple. And, and I really don't think the justices were buying that, that historical argument. So, but if this happened, it would um, have some practical effects. It might actually increase the number of trials the defendant is subjected to, or at least the number of indictments. On that point, uh, if the court uh, decides that retrial is the appropriate remedy for a trial in proper venue, uh, what are the practical effects? Would it come to be that Smith is could be sentenced to separate sentences on separate counts in separate district? And how do, would that work? So uh, let's say the government decided to prosecute him in the venues that the defense thinks are appropriate. So he'd have three indictments, well, two indictments, because he's been acquitted on the one. He'd be two indictments in two different places. You'd have two different judges, two sets of prosecutors, um, two sets of grand juries that indicted him, two sets of juries he'd hear the, that would hear the case. So um, as a practical matter for the defense, that's a terrible burden to, or to come for the defendant himself. Of course, 
financially and physically and emotionally, that's that's a terrible burden. For the government, the government's got a lot of resources. You know, they've got prosecutors and judges and you know jury panels in each district that are already existing. It isn't terribly hard to muster those things when we have standing courts. Um, so it really would have more of a negative effect if the government decided to go forward. Now, um, they have a conviction on one count here that did not get overturned. From my view, it's not worth bringing those char the other that, the remaining charge back. It's just not worth it. Um, they've got the conviction. They've got their orders from the court. You know, move on uh, would be, I think, the appropriate thing for them to do. But again, I'm not handling these cases. Fair enough. Well, thank you. Uh, last two questions, and then I may let us go early and give everybody back some time. Um, if the court decides that a retrial is the appropriate venue or the appropriate remedy, excuse me, is there a risk of creating a space for a form of jurisdiction shopping uh, for charges? If we try it incorrectly and we don't get it, you can try again in a separate space. Um, or, or is that not a concern here? Well, I, I think the way the petitioner articulated that was, look, the government could come back and retry the guy in one place and retry him in another and still yet another. Um, and, and the implication of their argument was, you know, the government may do this just out of spite or intentionally or what have you. Uh, but the government pointed out in its argument, look, you, you could have a situation where an individual um, case is overturned for an evidentiary issue. It's overturned for some other due process issue. But each time it goes back for retrial. And it's really no different um, on the venue issue if they have to go back and retry once or twice or three times. As a practical matter, um, it's going to have to be El Chapo before they start going after somebody like that in serial places or serial periods of time. It's just at some point there's a diminishing return for the government and um, law enforcement purposes to keep retrying the same person um, in different venues. Besides which, you yeah. probably puts it, put a stop to it. Fair enough. Oh well, one last question. One last question. Excuse me. That applies to both cases. Um, you've mentioned sort of how you felt the ruling may be, uh, but do you ever read, even a general or unsolidified one, of how the various members of the court will break out and what the major issues will be uh, in the opinions that come out in these two cases? Oh. I won't hold you to it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm terrible at predicting. So I think in um, Samia, I, I think that Justice Jackson is very skeptical of the um, position of the petitioner and that, I'm sorry, that I think I've got them confused, so forgive me. I, I think that Justice Jackson is very um, skeptical of the petitioner in Smith on the venue issues. She pushed pretty hard. With, and I think that she's going to be joined by the, the other justice. There really wasn't any, any of the justices who pushed back too hard on this retrial issue in, uh, with respect to Smith. Um, I do think there's sort of a split on the Bruton issue. Um, I think that um, Justice Sotomayor and Jackson and Comey Barra and... Um, Kagan and perhaps Justice Kavanaugh are leaning towards the size of the petitioner because as a practical matter, um, what, what they're saying as a functional, how do you do this way to go about it and keep fairness seems to make some sense. E even to me as a, as a former prosecutor, you would see judges say, okay, well, what is this about just to make sure that whatever the brutalized statement was, it didn't immediately implicate the other or one of the other co-defendants, because that, that's the key here. Does the statement, no matter how it's brutalized, say, hey, just on reading it, that person over there, the jury knows, is immediately guilty. So I think there's there's a, a good practical reason to support the, the petitioner here. Now, I think Justice Thomas, um, and Justice Alito may take a more traditional line that, you know, the jury instruction is sufficient here to protect the rights of the other defendants whose statement was not admitted. 
that's my thumbnail on it. Sounds excellent. Well, thank you. On behalf of the Budget Society, thank you, Mr. McBride, for the benefit of your valuable time and expertise today of taking on two cases uh, in one courthouse steps. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you to our audience for joining in and participating. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. And as always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about other upcoming virtual events. With that, thank you all for joining us today. I'll give you back a portion of your afternoon. We're adjourned.